On May 22nd, 2021, a father and his young son were out for a walk in their small suburban town just outside of Barcelona, Spain. When they reached their downtown, they were going to turn around and walk back home, but the boy pleaded with his father to make a quick stop at the old theater. The reason the boy and many other kids in the town loved going to this old theater was because out front of it was this huge paper mache statue of a dinosaur, a stegosaurus to be exact. And so after a little bit of convincing, the father finally agrees and they start heading in that direction. After they turned the corner and could actually see the dinosaur statue, the boy took off running while the father just stayed back and walked leisurely, watching his son the whole time. And as he's watching his son, he can see he gets right up to the statue, and then the boy just kind of suddenly stops and stares at something on the bottom of the statue. And so the father notices his son has seen something peculiar enough to make him stop and stare, and so he yells to his son, hey, what do you see? And the son just points at the back right leg of the statue. And so the father thinks this is really weird, so he jumps dogs up to his son and he crouches down right next to him and looks in the direction his son is pointing. And at first, the father believes all his son is pointing at is this fairly obvious crack on the outside of the statue on the back right leg. And he's thinking his son has just noticed that the statue is kind of falling apart. But as he's looking at this crack that his son is pointing at, he realized his son was not pointing at the crack. He was pointing at what was behind the crack, what was inside the dinosaur statue. And when the father realized what he was looking at, he grabbed his son, stood up, and ran in the other direction and called emergency services. A few minutes later, the police and fire department show up in front of this old theater. They get out and they go up to the statue and they confirm what's inside this back right leg. Afterwards, they go to their trucks and they get out chainsaws. Eventually, they were able to carve a big enough square on this back right leg that they were able to remove the thing that the father and the son had seen originally, and that was a dead man's body. Not much is known about this dead man, except that he was a 39-year-old man who his family had reported missing a couple of days before he was actually found. While we don't know this for sure, it's believed he decided to crawl inside the statue when he realized the belly of the dinosaur was movable. Now, it's not entirely clear how he figured that out, Either the belly was already moved and he saw the opening and so saw the opportunity to crawl inside for some reason, or he was poking and prodding at the statue and discovered the belly was movable, moved it aside, and then again seized the opportunity and crawled inside. But either way, the man crawled inside the statue, and then once he was in the dinosaur, his phone slipped out of his hand or slipped out of his pocket, and then instead of falling out of the dinosaur onto the ground, it fell inside the dinosaur and slid down the inside of the statue until it fell into the bottom of the bottom right hand leg. And so the man decides to go after his phone and so on his belly he slides over to the back right leg and then he begins lowering himself head first into the leg reaching for his phone. And so as he's kind of slowly lowering himself down using his legs to pin himself inside the statue he gets closer and closer and he's almost about to grab his phone when his feet lose their grip and he slips and falls head first all the way to the bottom of this back right leg. The space he was in was so tight he was not able to turn himself around and climb up and out again. In fact, it was so tight he could barely move. His arms were pinned by his side and so he couldn't use them to even push himself back up and out. And because he could not bend his legs, he could not use his legs to pull himself back out again either. And so this man most likely began screaming for help, but for whatever reason, nobody heard him. And so after what must have been several agonizing days, the man finally just died. His autopsy has not been made public, so we don't know for sure what actually killed him, although one could speculate he died of either dehydration or perhaps asphyxia from being trapped in this really tight space where his chest may not have been able to expand all the way, and so he would have eventually suffocated. Following the gruesome discovery, the dinosaur statue was removed from the front of the old theater. It was late afternoon on Saturday, July 18th, 2015, and Mary Yoder was out in her garden doing some weeding and replanting. It had rained early that morning, but now the sky over the little town of Whitesboro, located in the rural center of New York State, had the perfect amount of cloud cover, just enough to take the edge off the summer sun and heat. Mary smiled as she sat back on her heels and hooked her shoulder-length blonde hair behind her ears. Mary had just turned 60 four months ago, but with her strong arms and slim, athletic build, she looked and felt much younger. Not that age, at least as a number, was anything that Mary spent a lot of time thinking about. What interested her much more was healthy living and enjoying all the experiences and wisdom she had gained over the years. 
and at 60, she'd had enough time to develop a true passion for most of her hobbies. These included making beautiful hand-thrown pottery, trying out all forms of exercise, making sure she and her family ate well, and most recently, learning how to belly dance. But in the spring and summer, it was her prized garden that Mary loved the most. And every minute she spent out there among the flowers and vegetables, enjoying the natural beauty of her quiet surroundings, just added to her feelings of contentment and gratitude. Mary turned away from her garden and looked up from under the brim of her old baseball cap at her comfortable four-bedroom house that she shared with her husband, Bill. Not only had the two of them been married for almost 40 years, they were also business partners and chiropractors, healthcare professionals who treated pain related to nerve and skeletal disorders by manipulating a person's body. It was a method that some of their patients referred to jokingly as, quote, getting their backs cracked. Mary and Bill had established their practice, Family Chiropractic Care, back in 1987, just two years after they both had graduated from Life University in Georgia with their Doctor of Chiropractic degrees. It had felt good to come back to New York. Mary had been born there, and it was where she had originally met Bill back in 1977 when they were both attending undergrad at the University of Buffalo. 28 years after setting up their private practice, Mary and Bill both still loved Whitesboro, which was nestled right between the Adirondack and Catskill Mountains in a beautiful valley of land that bordered the Mohawk River. With under 4,000 residents, Whitesboro was more like a rural village than it was a big bustling town. Many of the homes, the Yoders included, were spread out and surrounded by huge lawns and fields. Even so, the people there knew each other, and everybody seemed to know Mary. Whether she was treating patients at Family Chiropractic, located just 15 minutes away from her home, or riding her bike, working in her garden, or shopping at the local health food store and farmer's market, Mary just gave off this aura of warmth and kindness that instantly drew people to her. And when Mary smiled and spoke to you, no matter how short the conversation was, you felt like you had all of her attention and energy. But Mary and Bill's quiet, predictable, nice little life in Whitesboro was about to change. In a couple of months, on September 5th, the couple was going on the longest vacation of their married lives, a month-long cruise and European tour that they had spent all of June planning together. And even though Mary and Bill hadn't said it to each other in so many words, they both knew that this long absence from work was another step towards their full-blown retirement. Bill was almost 70 years old, and starting a few months ago, the two of them had begun scaling back their work hours. Bill now worked only two half days a week at the office, while Mary worked two full days. And instead of being open Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., the office was now closed on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But as Mary turned back around and knelt down beside her garden again, she secretly thought to herself that she was probably slightly less interested in retirement now than Bill was. Being 10 years younger than him, she felt like she still had quite a bit of energy left. But as she thought about this, she also remembered that even when they chose to retire, even if it was tomorrow, they wouldn't get to actually retire right away. They would need to stay on for quite a while to train the next person who was going to come in and take over their practice. So it wasn't like this retirement was going to be an immediate shift. Plus, she could keep doing her outreach work as long as she wanted to, maybe even beyond their retirement, since it didn't really involve Bill. Mary's outreach work were her regular visits to nearby Amish settlements to provide chiropractic care for them. The Amish are part of a conservative religious sect that relies on farming to support and feed themselves. The Amish are known to live a very simple life with almost no modern technology, and so a lifestyle that relies so much on physical labor often leads to aches and pains, and so the non-medical treatments that Mary could offer them were met with gratitude, along with gifts of homemade pies and jams that Mary often counted as partial payment for her services. And while this willingness to work for food endeared Mary to the Amish, that kind of bookkeeping had not exactly made her and her husband rich. But once she and Bill actually sold their practice, they would finally have both the money and the time to travel, relax, pursue their own individual interests, and spend more time with their three adult children and their four wonderful grandchildren. As Mary finally stood up from her garden and stripped off her battered and dirty work gloves, she turned and looked again at the family home. 
and suddenly she found herself thinking of Adam. Adam had been the last of the Yoder kids to finally move out of the house. Thinking about her 24-year-old son, the baby of the family and younger than his sisters by more than 10 years, made Mary worry. Ever since graduating from high school, Adam had stumbled in life a lot more than his two older sisters had. He also struggled with bouts of depression and anxiety. Even now that Adam was out of the house and living on his own, it was obvious to Mary and Bill that he didn't really know what he wanted to do with his life quite yet. He was enrolled in college, but previously, when he had been in college, he had dropped out. In fact, Adam had enrolled and dropped out of college on more than one occasion. But for now anyways, he was in school, and so Mary and Bill were hopeful that he would just continue and he would graduate, and then he would fall into a career that he hopefully enjoyed. But the idea of Adam working a serious job long term truthfully didn't really compute. The only steady job Adam had ever held was his part and full-time jobs as office manager and receptionist at the family chiropractic offices. But Mary was hopeful for her son. He might be struggling now, but he was a wonderful young man with good intentions. For example, even though he no longer worked at the family chiropractic office because he was now focusing on school, he still made regular visits there just so he could say hello to his parents and give his mom a quick hug. He also made sure, before he stopped working at the office to focus on school, that he found his parents a replacement to work in the office. And the person he recruited was his lovely longtime girlfriend, Katie Conley. Mary and Bill initially had some reservations about this. Not about Katie, she was lovely, but about the fact that if they hired her and then she and Adam broke up, what would Katie do? Would she quit? Would she stay on? And if so, wouldn't that be really uncomfortable? And considering that Adam and Katie were one of those couples that were always on again, off again, this seemed like a pretty valid concern. But ultimately, Mary and Bill hired Katie, and pretty much right away, they knew it had been the right choice. Katie had that office humming so smoothly now that Mary couldn't even imagine the practice operating without her. Mary flexed her back and then looked up at the mountains off in the distance. Then, as she tried to push her concern for Adam out of her mind, she began walking toward the back door of the house. When she reached it, she opened it up and stepped inside, and instantly she heard Bill in the kitchen already getting a start on making dinner for the two of them. Before closing the door behind her, Mary took one last look back at her prized garden. The last of the clouds had cleared away, and so everything sparkled in the early evening sunlight. It was at moments like this, Mary thought, that life really did seem almost too good to be true. Two days later, on Monday, July 20th, 2015, Mary and Bill both woke at their usual time, around 6.30 a.m. After chatting for a few minutes and making the bed together, Bill headed into their exercise room to do a short workout before he made himself breakfast and got a start on the day's activities. It was his day off, and he planned to do a little reading and tackle a few household projects on a to-do list that never seemed to actually get any shorter. As he started his exercise routine, he could hear his wife's footsteps hurrying from room to room as she got ready for a long day at work. Mary always moved at top speed, and after 37 years of marriage, Bill knew that what his wife appreciated more than anything on a Monday morning was for him to stay out of her way. And since Mary had never been much of a morning eater, Bill also knew better than to offer to make her breakfast. When they kissed each other goodbye at 7.45 a.m. that morning, Bill was struck, as usual, by his wife's vitality and her warmth. It was Monday, the start of a busy day, and Mary practically glowed with good health and energy. A minute later, she had left the house and hopped into her car. She gave Bill one more wave before backing out onto King Road and heading west toward the offices of Family Chiropractic Care. Fifteen minutes later, Mary had arrived at the plain white medical building with its flat roof and box-like exterior. After pulling her car into the parking space right next to Katie's, Mary hopped out and just a minute later she was walking through the door of the front office. Katie looked up from her computer screen and the two women exchanged quick smiles and Katie held up a list of that day's appointments. This was Katie's way of telling her boss that no one had canceled and they had a full slate of patients. And sure enough, minutes after Mary's arrival, family chiropractic care was buzzing with activity and people. There were the usual packages and deliveries, along with back-to-back -back appointments, but that was just part of it. 
Mary was as much a friend as she was a doctor. And so it wasn't unusual for clients to drop by in person to schedule their appointments or just to say hello. And it wasn't just the front office that was busy. Mary also ran a side business out of the back office where she sold a line of organic nutritional supplements that included her favorite, the protein powder that she herself often mixed with almond milk and used as a meal substitute or pick-me-up. By the time 12.30 in the afternoon rolled around, Mary was ready for a break. Although it would have to be a very short break, since Mary also planned to use the lunch hour to go visit her 92-year-old mother who lived in nearby Utica. Telling Katie she'd be back by 1.30 p.m., Mary ducked into the back room where she used the office blender to mix up a quick protein shake for her lunch before making the 10-minute drive to her mother's house. About an hour later, just minutes before 1.30 p.m., Mary and Katie were both back in the office and opening the door to the first patient of the afternoon. As always, it was like turning on a faucet. Almost immediately, the office was alive with the sound of voices and the gentle clink of the doors opening and closing. It wasn't until Mary's 2.30 appointment that she started to notice something was wrong. She had just said hello to her patient, a woman named Elizabeth Kelly, who had been coming to Mary and Bill for 17 years, when Mary suddenly had to excuse herself to run to the bathroom. Aside from the occasional cold, Mary hardly ever got sick. And yet here she was, her hands gripping either side of the toilet, throwing up into the toilet bowl. As soon as her stomach had calmed down, Mary stood up, she cleaned the toilet thoroughly before scrubbing her hands in hot soapy water and then rinsing her face. When she got back out to the exam room, her patient looked concerned and asked Mary if she was feeling okay. It was just very unusual for Mary to look so uncomfortable and distracted. But Mary smiled at Elizabeth and gently shook her head and said it was nothing that a hot cup of ginger or peppermint tea couldn't cure. But by late afternoon, Mary was feeling even worse. And just the thought of herbal tea, even one that was supposed to soothe digestive disorders, was enough to send Mary right back into the bathroom. By 4.30 p.m., it was obvious to Katie that her boss was not feeling well because she was watching Mary make constant trips to the bathroom. But the 22-year-old office manager didn't want to embarrass Mary, so she kept her mouth shut. When 5.30 p.m. rolled around and it was time for Katie to leave for the day, Mary was still finishing up with her last patients. Before turning off her computer, Katie stood up and peeked her head into the exam room where Mary was working. In her quiet and now very concerned voice, Katie asked if Mary needed anything or maybe wanted Katie to stay until Mary was finished. But Mary shook her head no. She thanked Katie for the offer and told Katie to just be sure to lock the door and flip the open sign to closed when Katie left. At 6.45 p.m., Mary was finally finished with her workday. When she called her husband Bill to tell him she was heading home, she also told him that she must have picked up some sort of gastrointestinal virus and couldn't keep anything down, so don't worry about making any dinner for her. When Mary arrived home 15 minutes later, she barely paused long enough to shut the car door behind her before rushing into the house and heading straight for the bathroom. By bedtime, Mary was too uncomfortable with diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pains to sleep upstairs with Bill. Instead, she told her husband she'd rather just rest downstairs on the couch close to the downstairs bathroom. She told Bill not to worry and that she was sure she'd be feeling better by tomorrow. But when Bill came downstairs the next morning, Mary looked even worse. She was so pale and sweaty and disheveled that right then and there, Bill grabbed the telephone and he called their oldest daughter, Liana, a medical doctor who lived six hours away in Long Island, New York. When Bill described the situation to Liana, she told her father to get Mary to the hospital emergency room as soon as possible. At first, Mary wanted to wait long enough to take a bath and clean up, but even as Bill started filling the tub, Mary changed her mind. Almost too weak to stand up from the couch, she told her husband they needed to leave right now. By late afternoon, after Mary had been admitted to the hospital and doctors had begun aggressively treating her for what appeared to be a vicious stomach bug, Mary started to feel better. At about 6 p.m., Mary was finally all washed and clean, she was reasonably comfortable, and she was fully rehydrated. Also by 6 p.m., the doctors had looked over Mary's various scans of her bones and organs, and there were no signs of trauma or disease. 
Additionally, her blood work had come back and it was all normal. So even though they didn't know for sure, the doctors were reasonably confident that it really had just been a bad stomach bug. But because Mary's symptoms had been so severe, doctors wanted to keep her overnight, just to make sure that she really was on the mend before letting her go back home. At 9 p.m., Mary smiled at Bill, who had been sitting by her side the whole time, and told him to go back home and get some sleep. If there was any change in her condition, she or the nursing staff would give him a call. Bill thanked Mary and then gave her a kiss, and then he walked out of her room and made his way toward the front doors of the hospital. Within the hour, he was back at the Yoder house in his pajamas, brushing his teeth. When he was done, he turned his cell phone off and plugged it into a charging station in one of their empty bedrooms upstairs. Then he made his way across the hall to his own bedroom and climbed into the bed. By 10 p.m., he was fast asleep. It wasn't until the next morning at 5 a.m. when Bill heard a ferocious pounding on the front door that he realized something must be terribly wrong. When he pulled on his bathrobe and stumbled downstairs to open the door, he saw two state troopers waiting for him in their gray uniforms and broad-brimmed Stetson hats. They told Bill he had to get to the hospital right away. Mary had been moved overnight from an observation room to the intensive care unit. While Bill had slept peacefully, Mary's doctors had called Bill's cell phone and their landline again and again, trying to alert him to the fact that Mary was now gravely ill and fighting for her life, but Bill had not answered. The state police escort took Bill right into the parking lot of the hospital where Mary was staying. By 5.45 a.m., Bill was sitting in the ICU waiting area, calling each of his children to tell them it was time for all of them to get to the hospital as fast as they could. Then he made the same call to Mary's five sisters, two brothers, and her 92-year-old mother. And then finally, Bill was allowed into Mary's hospital room, and what he saw shocked him. Mary, her blue eyes full of pain and terror as she looked desperately into her husband's face, was now on life support. The only reason she was still alive was because doctors had been using electrical shocks to restart her heart each time it started to fail. Surrounded by her family, Mary held her husband's hand and closed her eyes. By 2.54 that afternoon of July 22nd, 2015, Mary Yoder, one of the healthiest people her family had ever known, was dead. Her heart had simply stopped beating. Immediately after Mary's death, the Yoder family requested an autopsy to find out how a gastrointestinal virus or infection could have killed an otherwise exceptionally healthy 60-year-old woman. That autopsy would be performed the very next day on the morning of July 23rd, but instead of getting any answers, the initial autopsy results were inconclusive, so even after releasing Mary's body for cremation, the medical examiner's office continued to run tests on the blood and tissue samples they had collected from Mary's body. Two days after the autopsy, on July 25th, Bill and his children invited family members and friends to join them in front of Mary's beloved gardens for a celebration of her life. It was Mary's favorite time of the year and all of her flowers were in full bloom. Afterward, Mary and Bill's daughter, Liana, did her best to pull the shattered Yoder family back together. Liana was most like Mary in terms of temperament and her practical hands-on approach to life and fixing problems. She encouraged her father to get in touch with their aunt Kathleen, Mary's older sister, who had also recently lost her spouse of many years. And Liana also encouraged her father and her brother, Adam, to go take a trip together to the West Coast just a couple of weeks so they could rest and hopefully begin to heal. But the first order of business, as far as Liana was concerned, was just to get her father and siblings out of Whitesboro. The calls and visits and gifts of food from friends and patients were well meant, but especially for Bill and for Katie, who had spent hours and even days at the office on the phone canceling appointments, it was just overwhelming. So Liana invited everyone to come back to her home in Long Island for a little getaway and a much needed change of scenery. The effort involved in doing anything seemed almost too much for Bill, but eventually he agreed. And even though Katie and Adam seemed to be in one of their relationship off cycles, Adam urged Katie to join them in Long Island too. 
In the weeks that followed, the Yoder family began the long process of healing. After the initial shock and disbelief over their mother's sudden and unexpected death, they had begun to accept the idea that Mary had just died of complications from a gastrointestinal infection, and they thought less and less about what the full autopsy report, which had not been released yet, might actually tell them. So, when Bill got a call on September 17th, 2015, almost three months after Mary's death, he was totally unprepared for what the doctors had to tell him. According to the full autopsy, Mary Yoder had not died of a gastrointestinal virus or infection. In fact, Mary Yoder had not died of any natural causes. Mary Yoder had been poisoned with a toxin called colchicine, the same drug found in a common prescription medication that is used to treat a painful form of arthritis called gout. In tiny and controlled amounts, colchicine helps reduce inflammation that causes pain. But in the lethal amount found in Mary's organs and blood, colchicine causes such profound damage to cells that the body's response is literally to order those cells to die. At first, Bill and his children were just as confused as they were alarmed by this revelation. The doctors had avoided using words like foul play or homicide. Instead, they told the family that the medical examiner's office was still evaluating the test results and considering its next steps. But less than one month later, on October 15th, when still no more word had come from Mary's autopsy, and so the family was left to just speculate on what might have happened to Mary, Mary's younger sister, Sharon Mills, who was convinced this was no accident, decided to just call the Oneida County Sheriff's Department and tell them as much. Oneida County was the department that served Whitesboro. And by the time Detective Van Namey had finally gotten off the phone with Sharon, he found himself agreeing that Mary's death did seem very suspicious. And so after Detective Van Namey spoke to his superiors, and they went over the autopsy report themselves, the Oneida County Sheriff's Office decided to open an investigation into Mary's death. Right from the start, Detective Van Namey knew he faced two huge challenges. Mary had died almost three months earlier, and if she had in fact been murdered, the trail was already going cold. He also knew from discussions with the medical examiner's office that it would be very hard to track down the source of the colchicine that had killed Mary, as doctors, either Mary or Bill, could have ordered colchicine, and since the drug also occurs naturally in some plants, investigators would have to check into Mary's gardening habits and what pesticides or chemicals she had been exposed to. And once Detective Van Namey found out that Mary was a heavy user of nutritional supplements, he knew it was possible that the poison could have been in one of her supplements. And so knowing he was getting a very late start and had some serious challenges ahead, the detective did not waste any time. He immediately requested access to Bill and Mary Yoder's phone records. And although Mary did not have a life insurance policy, so no one close to her stood to get a payout if she died, the detective still started to take a closer look at the Yoder's finances. Detective Van Namey ordered deputies to conduct interviews with family and friends to find out more about Mary's private life. He asked Katie Conley to come down to the station and give a statement about Mary's last day at work on July 20th, and he talked to the patients who had seen Mary that morning and afternoon. He arranged to have these supplements in Mary's back office at Family Chiropractic, tested for the presence of colchicine, and when it came to people of interest, Detective Van Namey already had one name at the top of his suspect list. In a town as small as Whitesboro, people were bound to talk. And if some of the rumors investigators had heard were true, it sounded like maybe Mary's perfect marriage wasn't so perfect after all. It would turn out that within two weeks of Mary's death, Bill had indeed connected with Aunt Kathleen, like his daughter Liana had suggested he do, Kathleen had recently lost her husband of many years, and she lived near the Yoder household, and so Liana figured she would be a good person to speak to as Bill went through his own grieving process. But apparently, Bill and Kathleen had begun doing more than just chit-chatting. By mid-September, just two months after Mary's death, Bill had become sexually and romantically involved with his sister-in-law. That relationship between Bill and Kathleen had caused a lot of tension among Mary's other siblings. One of Mary's sisters suggested that Bill was after Mary's money, 
and that in the weeks just before she died, Mary had placed a call to a marriage counselor, presumably to discuss problems in her marriage. And one of Kathleen's neighbors reported seeing Bill and Kathleen sharing a passionate embrace before Mary's death, suggesting that maybe Bill was having an affair while Mary was still alive. And while all of that was still unproven speculation, detectives did know one thing for sure about Bill. Mary's husband did not have an alibi for Monday, July 20th, the day investigators were now sure Mary must have ingested the colchicine that would later kill her. When Bill was interviewed by investigators, he conceded that him being home alone all day on July 20th with no alibi did make him look suspicious, but it was the truth, and he swore he had nothing to do with his wife's death. He then told police that if she really had been poisoned on the 20th, then there were dozens of people who could have administered the toxin, because on work days, dozens of people, clients, friends, colleagues, workers, would all pass in and out of family chiropractic, and so they would all have had access to Mary. When detectives asked Bill why he had turned his phone off and put it in the other room on the night Mary was in the hospital, Bill said he never slept with his phone nearby. It was just habit. And when he left the hospital, the doctors had told him that Mary was going to be okay, so he was not on heightened alert. And as for why he had not picked up all of the calls placed to the landline phone at their home that night, Bill said there was no landline extension in his room, so he just didn't hear the phone ringing in the other rooms, and so he never woke up to it. As for his decision to have Mary's body cremated, despite the autopsy report being inconclusive, Bill said cremation was what Mary had wanted, and the medical examiner had released her body and Bill was told they had all the tissue and blood samples they needed for further testing. Bill also freely admitted to his relationship with his sister-in-law Kathleen, but told detectives that he and Kathleen had never been involved either romantically or sexually before Mary died. And as for Bill's relationship with his wife, Bill never wavered on his description of their marriage as being strong and getting even stronger. They were in the process of planning a month-long vacation together, and after that, they were looking forward to retirement together. And according to Bill, the only reason he had even been drawn to Kathleen in the first place was because of his crippling grief over his wife's death. As for being motivated to harm his wife for her money, Bill said that was absurd. He had an inheritance that he had gotten from his father, and he knew that as soon as they sold their medical practice, he and Mary would both get to live very comfortably for the rest of their retirement. But even as Detective Van Namey began following up on all of the things that Bill had said during his interview, the investigation into Mary's death took a sudden and completely unexpected turn. On November 26th, roughly four months after Mary's death, both the Oneida County Sheriff's Department and the Office of the Medical Examiner received copies of a shocking letter a letter that would instantly put a new name at the top of Detective Van Namey's list of possible suspects, a name to that point that no one had considered. Spread across two typewritten pages, the letter gave chilling details of how someone had intentionally killed Mary. And midway through the description of motive, method, and the crushing grief that the killer felt after committing the murder, the killer revealed their identity. It was Mary's own son, Adam Yoder. When Detective Van Namey finished reading this letter, he carefully slipped it into a clear plastic evidence bag. Then he took off the gloves he'd used to handle the letter and sat back in his chair. He told his deputies to get the letter over to the forensics lab and test for fingerprints and DNA, any and everything that would help them confirm the identity of the writer, and the authenticity of the letter. After tasking his forensic team, Detective Van Namey began digging into Adam's background, and it didn't take long to uncover some troubling information. Back in July 2014, a year before his mother died, Adam had been accused of rape. The charge was later dropped at the victim's request, and legally it had no bearing or place in the current investigation, but if it was true, the event that was described in the victim's statement painted the picture of someone who was definitely capable of violence and brutality. It also described a person who was jealous and needy and who struck out at people close to him. 
There were other red flags in Adam's background as well. There was Adam's checkered employment history. There was a civil lawsuit filed by one of his landlords that sued Adam for significant damages to an apartment Adam rented. There was Adam's intense on-again, off-again relationship with Katie. There were reports that Adam suffered from depression and anxiety. And there was Adam's financial dependence on his parents. And even though Adam did have an alibi for July 20th, the day that Mary was poisoned, it didn't actually mean that Adam could not have committed the crime. Police already knew that starting on July 15th, Adam had been in Long Island visiting his sister Liana, and he had only left Long Island at about 8 p.m. on the night of July 21st after getting the news from his father that his mother was sick and in the hospital. But according to the confession in the letter that the police received, Adam had put the colchicine into the nutritional supplements that his mother took like clockwork every day. Meaning, it didn't matter if Adam was not physically near his mother on the 20th. He could have put the poison into one of her many supplement powders before he left for Long Island on the 15th, and then it was just a matter of time before she actually consumed it. Finally, in December, after a meeting with all the investigators involved in the Mary Yoder case, Detective Van Namey was ready. He picked up the phone and he dialed Adam's number. Shortly after receiving the request from Detective Van Namey to come into the station for a formal interview, Adam left his apartment in Frankfurt, New York and made the 30-minute drive north to the Oneida County Sheriff's Department. At about 10.30 a.m., Adam made his way inside the brick building that housed the Sheriff's Department, where he was immediately escorted to an interrogation room. Adam did not look good. He shifted in his chair, his hand drifting to the pocket in his pants where he kept his pack of cigarettes. He'd lost weight and he seemed pale and nervous. When Detective Van Namey had called Adam earlier that morning and asked him to come to the station, he didn't mention the letter police had received 12 days earlier with Adam's confession in it. The detective had told him this interview was just routine, that earlier that week the police had also taken formal in-person statements from Adam's two sisters. And now that Adam was sitting nervously right in front of Detective Van Namey, the detective decided that instead of just confronting Adam with the information in the letter, he'd start by repeating the routine questions that investigators had asked him informally earlier in the investigation. Questions about Adam's alibi, Adam's last recent contacts with his mother, and when Adam had last been inside of family chiropractic care. As Adam appeared to relax a little bit and answered these questions the same way he had before, Detective Van Namey decided it was time to start throwing in some specific information from the letter, like the whereabouts of the poison that had been used to kill Mary. And so after Adam had answered the last of the easy questions, Detective Van Namey leaned forward and asked Adam if he would give police permission to, right now, go outside and search under the front passenger seat of his Jeep Wrangler. Instantly, Adam's whole demeanor changed. He stiffened and looked up sharply at Detective Van Namey. Then, breaking the tense silence, Adam said he really needed to speak to a lawyer. Detective Van Namey offered to get one of the court's public defenders on the phone, and a little while later, detectives left the room so Adam's phone conversation with the attorney was private. A few minutes later, Adam hung up the phone, and the police officers came back into the interrogation room. Adam sat slouched in his chair, his elbows on the table and his head in his hands. Then, as if coming to a very hard decision, Adam reached out slowly and pulled the search and seizure agreement on the table towards him, and he signed his name. By mid-afternoon, Adam was standing in an empty parking lot outside of the Oneida County Sheriff's Department jail, watching as gloved police officers opened the front passenger side of his 1991 black Jeep Wrangler. Nervous, Adam pulled out his pack of cigarettes and lighter. He stuck one cigarette into the corner of his mouth, he lit it, and he started to smoke. A few minutes later, one of the officers who was conducting the search suddenly stepped back out of the Jeep. In his hand was now a cardboard sleeve, and nestled inside of that sleeve was a brown glass bottle, along with a crumpled up piece of paper. The glass bottle contained the deadly toxin colchicine, and the crumpled up paper was a receipt for the colchicine. The bottle of toxin had been ordered online from a company called Art Chemical by a customer named Adam Yoder, who had told them he needed the toxin to conduct a scientific experiment. 
However, as much as this evidence seemed to very clearly put an end to the mystery of who killed Mary Yoder, it would turn out this discovery in Adam's car was only the beginning of a much bigger and more twisted story. It would take investigators another six months, but they would finally uncover all the details. Here is a reconstruction of how and why Mary Yoder was murdered. Back on December 22, 2014, roughly seven months before Mary's death, her killer walked into a New York supermarket and used cash to buy a prepaid credit card worth $150. Nine days after that, Mary's killer used that prepaid MasterCard to pay for one gram of the deadly toxin colchicine that they had just ordered online from a company called Art Chemicals. The killer also made sure to use a fake email account when they checked out. Because colchicine is a lethal and therefore regulated substance, Art Chemicals required a letter of intent from the purchaser that stated how the toxin was going to be used. The killer had already prepared that letter, typed on family chiropractic care letterhead, saying that the poison would be used in a series of plant experiments. At the bottom of the letter were two signatures, Adam Yoder and Mary Yoder. Two and a half months later, on February 6, 2015, the package containing the colchicine arrived at the bustling office of Family Chiropractic Care. Like every other delivery, Katie just got up and signed for it, and then without opening it, she set it down with the other packages near the front desk. And then later that day, Mary's killer would secretly grab that package and smuggle it out of the store without anyone noticing. Five months later, on Monday, July 20th, Mary's killer slipped into the back office of Family Chiropractic Care, where Mary kept and sold nutritional supplements. After making sure no one else was back there, the killer pulled the brown glass bottle of colchicine from their coat pocket. The killer had done plenty of research, googling website after website, that described in detail the effects of colchicine and the tiny margin that existed between lethal and non-lethal doses. One gram was more than enough to poison dozens of people, so Mary's killer had to measure out the exact amount, enough to cause death even if Mary sought medical treatment right away, but not enough that Mary would die immediately. Mary's killer wanted Mary's death to take a few days. This way, it would seem like Mary had died of a gastrointestinal virus or infection. The killer also knew that once they administered a lethal dose of colchicine, there was no turning back. Mary's death would be a foregone conclusion. Because colchicine is a poison that spreads very quickly throughout the bloodstream. As soon as the toxin comes in contact with a human cell, it damages the cell so profoundly that the body's response is to order that damaged cell to self-destruct meaning what would appear to Mary and her family and doctors as vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal cramps was really the slow and horribly painful process of Mary's tissues committing suicide. Mary's killer carefully measured out an amount of colchicine that was equal to several dozen individual grains of sugar. Then the killer added them to the ingredients Mary would use to make her lunchtime protein shake. The killer then carefully closed the brown bottle and slipped it back into their coat pocket, and then seconds later, they were gone. A few hours later, it was time for lunch. Mary stepped into the back office, and even though she'd had a busy morning, she still had plenty of energy. She glanced at her watch, 12.30 p.m. At least her last morning appointment had ended on time, which meant she could still make the short trip out to Utica and visit her 92-year-old mother. Still thinking ahead to the rest of the day, Mary quickly moved toward the small refrigerator and pulled out the carton of almond milk and set it on the counter next to her open container of protein powder. She looked inside the can and saw there was just about one serving left. After mixing together the powder and almond milk in the blender, Mary turned on the blender and waited until the mixture was thick and frothy. A few minutes later, Mary tipped the last swallow of the protein shake into her mouth. Before leaving the office, Mary washed out the empty glass and the blender jar and called out to Katie that she'd be back in the office by 1.30 at the latest. By the time Mary left the office to go visit her mom in Utica, she was already dead. She just didn't know it yet. 
sitting by herself on the couch in the living room after she had shooed her husband Bill to their bedroom upstairs, she had no way of knowing that there was no European vacation ahead for her. No retirement and no more warm summer days spent in her garden. The only thing in Mary's future now was 48 hours of intense physical and emotional suffering followed by death. Mary would have one brief period the next day in the hospital when pain and anti-nausea medication along with replacement fluids would blunt the symptoms of her body's internal collapse. But by the time Mary's husband had fallen asleep peacefully at their home on the evening of July 21st, Mary's organs had already begun to shut down. And by the time her children and husband had gathered at the hospital on July 22nd, Mary's heart would only have enough strength to keep beating long enough for Mary to say goodbye to her husband and her children. Meanwhile, as Mary slipped into cardiac arrest at 2.54 p.m. on the afternoon of July 22nd, Mary's killer sat by themselves in the quiet, empty office at Family Chiropractic Care. Caitlin Conley, affectionately known for years to Bill and Mary Yoder as Katie, their trusted family friend, their office manager, and their son's longtime girlfriend, stared at the screen on her cell phone. She was waiting eagerly for news from the hospital, and with a thrill of dark satisfaction, Katie imagined the grief and pain that Adam must be feeling as he watched his mother die. It would turn out Adam and Katie didn't just have an on-again, off-again relationship, they had an incredibly toxic and abusive relationship. And when Adam had finally broken up with Katie for good back in August of 2014 after Katie had accused him of raping her, Katie had snapped. There had been plenty of other times over the course of their four-year-long relationship where she had manipulated Adam into getting back together with her after they'd broken up. A faked pregnancy and miscarriage, taking him to court over a loan she had made to him that he had not paid back, the threat she might commit suicide. But after that charge of rape that she had filed against Adam back in July of 2014, she knew deep down that even if they did get back together, it wouldn't be for long. Katie had withdrawn the charge, but Adam had been shocked and deeply shaken by what he said was a totally false allegation. And so by August 2014, Adam had decided that the only way to protect himself was to stay away from Katie Conley. But Katie couldn't let that happen, at least not without making Adam suffer first. So beginning back in early 2015, shortly after their official breakup, Katie started laying her plan for revenge. She would take from Adam the thing he loved the most, the person who was always there when he needed help, his mother, Mary Yoder. And Katie would be so clever about how she planned this murder that instead of anyone suspecting her, she would make it look like Adam was the killer. She had set up a fake email account under his name and used it to buy the colchicine. She had also paid for the poison with a prepaid card she'd registered in Adam's name. And she'd signed Adam's name to that letter of intent that was sent to the colchicine distributor, Art Chemicals, saying how the poison was going to be used in a science experiment. As for conducting the actual murder, that was too easy. Katie just signed for the toxin at work, and no one noticed because she signed for all the packages. Then she took it home with her for safekeeping until July 20th, at which point she just walked into the back office, and when no one was looking, she pulled it out and she spiked Mary's protein shake ingredients. And then, following Mary's death, Katie would plant the bottle containing the toxin under the front seat of Adam's car, and then in the anonymous letter that Katie would write and send to police, she would not only tell them to look in Adam's car for the toxin, but she would also tell them that Adam was the killer that he had confessed to her about killing his mother because apparently his mom had not been giving him the attention he needed and deserved, that he felt like she had abandoned him, and so he had snapped. But in reality, when Detective Van Namey got that letter, he didn't believe what it said. It just seemed too convenient, like whoever had written it and sent it in was probably just trying to frame Adam. And so right after getting this letter, Detective Van Namey had turned to Katie to learn more about Adam to see who might want to frame him. And not only did Katie seem to go out of her way to paint Adam in a very negative light, 
She also confessed that she was the one who wrote the letter. She insisted that Adam had admitted his guilt to her, and so she had written the letter because she was afraid that if Adam didn't get arrested right away, he might hurt her, Katie, like he had hurt her when he tried to rape her. When Adam arrived at the police station for that interview on December 8, 2015, it just didn't make any sense to investigators that if Adam was the murderer, why would he agree to a search of his car that he knew would turn up that bottle of colchicine? And when they tested that bottle for DNA and fingerprints, the only match they got was for Katie, not Adam. On June 13th, 2016, Caitlin Conley was arrested and charged with planning and carrying out the murder of Mary Yoder. If she was convicted, she would have faced life in prison. But on May 18th, 2017, after a jury could not reach a unanimous verdict, the judge declared a mistrial. It wouldn't be until the end of a second trial in January of 2018 for the lesser charge of manslaughter, which is committing an unintentional killing, that Katie would be found guilty and sentenced to 23 years in prison. In the early 1980s, John Harder was the classic, athletic, popular kid at his high school in Delaware, Ohio, which is a relatively small town just outside of the state's capital. But unlike most stereotypes that paint high school jocks as being these total jerks that bully people and they're kind of stupid, John was none of those things. He was incredibly friendly and very warm-hearted and seemed to get along with everyone. John also was known for having a great sense of humor. In particular, he liked to play these kind of harmless pranks that would make people smile, like the time he very enthusiastically joined the cheerleaders during a high school pep rally, despite not actually being a cheerleader himself. John was set to graduate from high school on June 5th, 1983, and his plan was to study accounting at Kent State University the following year. A few weeks before his graduation, John's high school began selling these tickets to a grad night at a huge amusement park called Kings Island. Kings Island was located about two hours west of John's high school, and it was home to dozens of roller coasters, water slides, and many other other attractions. During their so-called grad nights, this amusement park would shut down their public operations and not let anybody into the park that did not have these special student tickets that they gave to local area high schools. John, who was 17 years old at the time, was very excited at the idea of going to this grad night, and so he went and purchased tickets along with about 20 other students from his high school. At about 3.30 p.m. on Friday, May 13th, John and the other students who had bought grad night tickets met up outside of their high school. While this was a school-sponsored trip, the students were responsible for driving themselves to the park. And so after all the students were accounted for, they all piled into a couple of their cars and they began their journey to the park. After a few stops along the way to get food and go to the bathroom, the students finally arrived at the park at about 7 p.m. And on the drive, John, who had been a passenger, had drank half a bottle of rum and about three to six beers. And so when he got out, he could barely stand he was so drunk. And so the students made their way over to the front gate, they showed the attendant their grad night ticket, and they were allowed inside. And surprisingly, despite it being this special night where only people with these tickets were allowed in, it was still pretty crowded. There were lots of students that apparently wanted to come to this event. Once John and the rest of the students from the Delaware High School had come inside the park, there was no rule that they had to stick together for the duration of their time there, and so they all kind of broke into their separate groups and went their separate ways. In John's particular group was his girlfriend Pam, and for the first hour they were in the park together, all they did was bicker and fight. Onlookers would say John looked visibly upset and very emotional and very drunk. By 8.30 p.m., when John's group had gotten in line for this roller coaster, John was now openly saying, I don't want to be here anymore, I just want to go home. It was pretty obvious he was still just mad at Pam, and that's why he was saying all this, was just trying to make Pam feel bad. And so some of the group members told John just, hey man, calm down, you're overreacting, just try to enjoy this ride, and then afterwards we'll get some food, it'll be fine. But it was pretty clear that John was really worked up and seemed incapable of having a good time at this point. But regardless, John and the rest of the group, they got on this ride, at about 9 p.m. and then after the ride was over they disembarked and they walked away from the ride to regroup and figure out what was next and they're looking around and John is nowhere to be found and so after waiting for a few minutes and actually walking around looking for him they decided that you know what he was really upset before he got on this 
this ride. He probably just wanted to walk away and be by himself for a bit. I'm sure we'll see him later in the night. So John's group, without John, just continued going around the park, going on different rides. And for the next few hours, they kind of forgot about John. It wasn't until the end of the night when over the loudspeaker, the park officials said, okay, we're closing the park now, that they started walking out and wondering where John was. And they were convinced, you know what? I'm sure he's back at the cars. He's probably waiting for us because he just wants to go home. And so they leave the park, they get out to their cars in the lot and John's not there. And so at this point, the group's starting to get a little bit concerned because no one knows where he is. They're meeting up with the other groups from their high school. No one's seen John. And so they're all just kind of staring at the front gate, waiting for John to come out, but he doesn't. And then eventually the lights in the park start shutting down and the security guard comes out front and locks the front gate. And that's when the group knew they had a problem. After an extensive investigation by police, this is their best guess as to what happened to John. After John and his small group rode that roller coaster around 9 p.m., John very quickly disembarked the ride before anybody else in his group could see him. And then John stumbled his way towards the replica Eiffel Tower that this park was famous for. This tower stood at about 300 feet tall and was built to be an exact replica of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. But this one at Kings Island was only a third the size. It had three elevators that went up the center of the structure and the elevators would stop at a 50 foot platform and a 275 foot platform where guests could look out and have a great view of the park. While today, the only way to access these two viewing platforms is through these elevators. At the time John was at the park in 1983, the park actually had a flight of stairs that went from the ground all the way to the very top of the tower that went right up the middle of the structure and the public was allowed to take these stairs all the way up to the first platform that 50 foot platform and while the stairs did actually continue beyond that up to the 275 foot platform the public was not allowed to go any higher on the stairs than that first platform and so if you took these stairs once you got to the 50 foot platform there would be a big fence right on the stairwell preventing you from going any farther and it says authorized personnel only don't go any farther and so the only people that would walk up those additional flights of stairs were staff that had a special key. When John stumbled his way over to the base of this replica tower, he did not get on an elevator. Instead, he took the stairs. So he made his way up to the 50-foot platform. And then when he got to the six-foot tall gate preventing him from going any farther, he just climbed up and over it and continued walking up the stairs and nobody stopped him. He finally came to a stop just below the 275-foot mark. And so he's on the stairs well and at this point he turns and faces the inside of the tower it's all these metal beams all over the place and he climbs over the railing of the stairs he's on and he climbs onto this narrow beam that's actually a part of the support structure of this tower and he grabs onto the beam above him and just begins walking along this beam towards the center of the tower where the three elevator shafts are now there's no safety net on either side of John so if he slips and falls he's falling hundreds of feet to the ground and if he keeps walking and actually gets in to the elevator shaft, there's nothing protecting him from being struck by one of the elevators because the people who built this tower were not thinking about people walking on these exposed beams hundreds of feet up into the air. This is a totally dangerous and unauthorized area. But John just continues shimmying across this beam until he does get to the middle of the tower and now he's literally standing looking down into the elevator shafts. And as he's most likely looking around admiring where he was, one of the elevator cars below him began to start moving. To understand what happens next, you need to have a rudimentary understanding of how this elevator worked. A large metal rope was attached to the top of the elevator car, and from there it was thread up the elevator shaft all the way to the top, where it was fed through a pulley that was anchored to the ceiling, and then that rope was fed right back down the shaft to the bottom, where it was attached to a counterweight. A counterweight is just a large heavy weight that's designed to balance this elevator car on this pulley system. Without the weight, the elevator car would just slip off of that pulley. And so anytime the elevator car moved up, the counterweight would move down and vice versa, making sure that car was always balanced. And so John is standing right on the edge of this elevator shaft, presumably just kind of looking around, admiring where he was, when down below him, that elevator car starts to move and it starts to actually descend away from John. And so the car itself is not necessarily a threat to John. However, it's counterweight is because if the car is going down, its counterweight is going up and it's right in the path of John. And so as John is leaning out over the shaft, looking around, this counterweight comes screaming up and picks him off of the beam he's on and carries him up into the shaft. The impact on John
Khan was so strong that it's believed he was actually impaled on some of the exposed metal wiring on top of this counterweight, and he got totally tangled up in all of the cables on top of there. And so as John is desperately trying to free himself, the elevator operator, there was always a staff member inside of these elevator cars, he actually noticed when John got stuck on the counterweight. But of course, this worker would have no idea that's what it was. They would later recall, it just felt like the car suddenly jumped. And so this worker, fearing that something had gone wrong with the elevator car itself, he decided he would ride it all the way to the bottom, let everybody get out, and then ride back up to the top, totally empty, to make sure that the car actually worked before allowing people back on. And so the worker went to the ground, everybody got out, he closed the doors, he began his ascent, he got to that first platform at 50 feet, no issues, he got about 10 feet above that first platform, so at about 60 feet, when all of a sudden he hears an unbelievably loud thud on the roof of his elevator car, causing his car to immediately come to a stop. And then blood began pouring over the sides of the car over the windows. After getting stuck on the counterweight, John probably did everything he could to try to free himself, but he just couldn't do it. However, when that elevator worker decided to go back up again to test the capacity of the elevator car, it reversed the direction of the counterweight that John was stuck on. And so as that car was going up, John began going down, and it was on this descent that parts of John's body must have been dangling off of this counterweight, and they must have struck one of the beams as he was going down, and that beam effectively pried him off of whatever he was stuck on and threw him over the edge into the center of the shaft. And so John would fall 200 feet and he would land on top of that elevator car, dying instantly. The park was very quick to block off the ride and the whole scene and got police involved very quickly. So only a very small number of guests and employees were aware an accident had even happened. And very few of them were aware that it had been a fatal accident. As for the police, they knew they had a dead body, but they had no way to identify the body. There was no ID cards on John. And so they had no way to let his friends know that were in the park or to tell his family. And so it wasn't wasn't until that night when John's friends are out in the parking lot waiting for John to come out again that they got really worried and they went up and spoke to a security guard at the front of the park and that security guard after hearing their story would tell them that actually there had been an accident in the park and there was a body and the police are still trying to identify this body and so maybe you guys want to go over to the hospital and see if it's your friend. And so sure enough the friends went to the hospital and they would confirm that the body was John Harder. To this day no one knows for sure why John did what he did. Some say he was just drunk and it was a dumb decision that led to his death. Others say he was suicidal, but many of the people that were close to him say, no way, he was not suicidal. And other people say, you know, John, he loved attention. And so perhaps this was a dangerous stunt gone too far. But regardless of his reasons, John had clearly intentionally entered an area that was off limits and it got him killed. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's video, Street to the rhythm of our heartbeat. Her smile lights up the dark like a spark in the park. Chicago City romance in the air with a cute girl's voice so fair. But uh oh, oh, let it all goes from the 80s past. On Friday, August 21st, 2020, 58-year-old Aristides Polino was driving back to his home in Miami, Florida in his police SUV after completing a midnight shift. Aristides was a 25-year veteran of the Miami police force, and over the last two plus decades, he had routinely done midnight shifts, so this was nothing new. When he got to his house, he parked his SUV in the driveway, and like always, he went right into his house. He didn't talk to his wife, Clara, or his son. He just went straight up to his bedroom and immediately fell asleep. About four hours later, at 5 p.m., Aristides woke up and he expected to hear his wife's voice somewhere in the house. So when he didn't, and the house was just totally silent, something told him that something was off. 
So he climbed out of bed, he put on his clothes, and he went downstairs to look for his wife. When he got down to the living room, he saw his son sitting on the couch, but he didn't see his wife. And so he asked his son, you know, hey, have you seen your mom? And he would say, no, I haven't seen her. But sensing on his dad's face that something was wrong, he said, hey, I'll help you look for mom. And so the two men began searching the house, yelling out for Clara, and Aristides began calling his wife, but she wasn't picking up. And after several minutes, the two men reconvened in the living room, and they started going over whether or not she had told them about some appointment that day, and that would explain why she wasn't in the house. House. But after talking about it, they decided that she didn't have any appointments and she should be home right now. And so the men decided, you know, maybe she went outside and she's talking to a neighbor or, you know, she went for a walk and she's talking to somebody on the road. And so they decided they would go outside and search the outside of the property. When they got outside, Aristides went towards the back of the property and his son went towards the front down towards the driveway. And so as Aristides is making his way around the back of the property, he hears his son scream out for help. Aristides comes running back on the property and he sees his son standing in the driveway with the door of his police SUV wide open. Four hours earlier, after Aristides came home, he parked his police SUV right in the driveway like he always did and for some reason he left the car unlocked. And so he goes in the house and he falls asleep. And while he was sleeping, Clara, who was home, she exited the house and walked down the driveway to his SUV. She opened up the door and went inside. It's believed she was looking for something, although we don't know what she was looking for. And while she was in the back of his car, fishing around for whatever it was she was looking for, the door she had entered the vehicle in shut behind her. And because this is a police SUV, the back seat was designated for suspects. And so the back two doors did not open from the inside. And there was a very thick partition separating the back seat from the front seat. So Clara could not just reach over the seats and honk the horn to get someone's attention. And Clara Clara did not have her cell phone, so she couldn't call anyone for help. And when she screamed out for help to somebody out on the road to help her, her screams were severely muffled, and the back windows of this police car were heavily tinted, making it extremely difficult to see that there was a person in the back seat of this car. So for four hours, Clara desperately screamed and kicked and punched and did everything she could to try to free herself from the situation she was in. All the while, the temperature inside the car continued to go up. The SUV was parked in full sunlight, no shade whatsoever, and the temperatures that day were over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so by the time Clara was ultimately discovered, the inside of that SUV had effectively become an oven. Aristides ran over to his vehicle and he pulled his wife out and he started doing CPR on her, but it was too late. She had died of heat stroke. Her death was ultimately ruled an accident.